good to meet you both. I'm excited to unpack, you know, as, as someone who's been in sales forever, a little skeptical of most sales books. I feel like I've read most of them. Um, you guys talk about spin selling, which brings back like fond memories. Um, but it's a privilege to connect with you guys and, and uh, learn more about um, the recent book that you published. Yeah, it's great to be with you. Thanks for, yeah, thanks thanks for, for having us on. There's a place I wanted to start, and I think this is a fun setup, hopefully. And you guys, uh, you know, have been writing and talking about sales for a long time. I'm wondering through the millions of conversations that you guys listen to and, and just generally, I'd love to hear what do you think are the most common pitfalls for most salespeople? Like, what did you come away with and say, look, these are the few things that like, you know, this new world, these are the, these are the main pitfalls that come to mind that you got to stop doing. Yeah, I mean it's uh, it's a really good question. What I should say, up front, I might answer that in in two different ways. So one is, I would say in general, I think there there are three, I call them like three challenges to like today's B two B salesperson. But we could also think of them as pitfalls, uh, things that things that befall us on our way to a signed deal. Um, the first one uh, we wrote about a number of years ago in the challenger sale, which is the problem of customers learning on their own, right? They go to your website, they go to your competitors' websites, they they make up their mind about what they need, uh, who you are, what you can do for them, how you compare to your co competitors, and then they they have you come in late in the game and that force you to compete on price. So challenger was a story about how do you how do you combat that? How do you how do you deal with a customer who who thinks they've they've already cemented their mental model about what they think they need? Um, now the the second challenge um, I think that that we encounter is uh, the challenge of consensus buying, and this is actually especially pronounced if we do come in and we do what we say in Challenger, which is we challenge the customer to think differently about a different kind of opportunity. Well, if it's kind of opportunity they've never thought about before, you're just increasing the consensus dynamic, right? You're 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 raising the bar that you're going to have to overcome to uh, or surmount in order to get them to move forward. And I think all people in B2B sales know that um, the buying committee is where like great first sales meetings go to die because they're, you know, they have this one person who's really fired up and then they go behind closed doors and they come and say, well, we decided it's not the right time. So the Challenger customer was the second book we wrote, which is really a, a study of um, consensus buying, that whole dynamic. And it looks specifically at what type of stakeholder do um, top reps target and how do they leverage those individuals to get the whole committee on board? So that's the second challenge. I think the third big pitfall is the one we write about in the new book, The Jolt Effect, which is um, the problem of no decision losses. And these are these are particularly vexing. And I, I would say this is a, a even bigger problem right now in the current economy. And it's likely to get worse over the next few years. Um, is the the customer who says they're on board, and even the customer who says the buying committee is on board, and then they ghost you or they uh, they disconnect and they go radio silent and they start getting cold feet and um, and they never end up crossing the finish line. And so we end up marking them at, as closed lost in CRM, you know, tag, tag it as no decision. We don't know why. But they uh, say one thing, but they mean another, but we don't know what they really mean. Yeah. Yeah. So I think those are, if I thought of, if I think about it at the highest level, I think those are the three big chasms that today's B2B seller has to cross. And that's with a, a placeholder on future chasm. So we discover later, but for now, I think those are three big ones. I, now I think what Ted, you, Ted, you probably talk about this a little bit, but the problem in the new book with studying two and a half million sales calls is, um, you know, the answer to your question is actually really hard to answer. If we, if we looked at it specifically through the lens of two and a half million sales calls, like you listen to two and a half million sales calls, what do people do wrong? Like what are the, the big things they screw up? And the problem is that it's such a big data set that you have to go in with a, a specific thing you're studying. So what we studied was um, why do customers who say they want to move forward end up not doing so? Like what is the root cause of no decision losses and what do the best salespeople do to overcome that? That being said, I suspect that that data set is a, and Ted, tell me if you agree with this, is a treasure trove of screw ups in terms of <laughs> other other stuff we should avoid doing. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's probably true. Uh, you know, the the um, as Matt, you were going through those three different um, pitfalls. You know, the common thread, of course, is a lot of that originates with what's going on with buyers and how they're evolving. Yeah. Um. And so, so that I think is is kind of the common thread. And I think, you know, when, when we look at the latest study, the thing that kind of comes to mind is, um, and it does relate to you know a lot of mess ups <laughs> that you see actually happening from a rep perspective is they overestimate the uh, the power of pain. 
so that they run that pain train, uh, you know, and that's, that's the playbook they keep coming back to is my job is to persuade by showing them how painful things are. And that's just, they just keep going back to that same play every single time. Um, and we show through the data, there are moments, quite a few that, that especially in, in places where the buyer is kind of stuck with indecision when that backfires, but it is, I think from a rep perspective, that is kind of the trap they keep falling into, which is like pain is my friend. I need to keep dialing that up. Yeah, it's and this is this is definitely a longer uh, answer than you you <laughs> for, but but I think Ted Ted nailed it. Yeah, that's right. In the new book, um, I think that you know what we talk about is we have all in sales been taught forever that the only reason a customer would ghost you or go radio silent or disengage after they said they wanted to buy from you, the only possible reason is that they're still stuck in the the vice grip of the status quo, right? They still believe what they do today is fine. Uh, they don't believe what you're talking about is a superior alternative or compelling enough reason to change. They don't believe it's a top priority. It's all value-based stuff, right? And so we go back and we, as Ted said, we dial up the pain. We dial up the FUD, the fear, uncertainty, and doubt. We create the burning platform. We try to re-articulate all the benefits and ROI projections of our platform uh, or our solution. And if all that fails, we dangle like a 10% discount in front of them and say, hey, you're going to, you know, this price is only good this quarter. You got to move forward. And, and as Ted said, it was surprising to us that this backfires more often than it works out because it, it, what those all are are basically FOMO based reasons to uh, to move forward, right? You're going to miss out on the discount. You're going to miss out on this, this opportunity to, to fix your crappy status quo. You're going to miss out on this opportunity to buy our vastly superior solution and improve the performance of your business. It's all FOMO, right? But we found is like it's not our inability to dial up the FOMO that gets people off the fence. It's our inability to dial down the FOMO, the fear of messing up, right? That's the thing that keeps people from moving forward. And that was a big surprise. And that's why it's such a it's such a head fake for us in sales. And it's not the fault of the salesperson. Um, it's honestly we have only ourselves to blame. And it's years of sales guidance and managerial wisdom and conventional wisdom that that is told perpetuated this view that when people start to get cold feet, just hammer the status quo, dial up the FOMO and they will move forward. Uh, and, and that is, as we talk about, often makes things worse, not better. It was one of my favorite quotes. And you guys have said this a few in a few different ways. One of my favorite was people actually feel more regret when bad things result from their actions, as opposed to when bad things happen as a result of their inactions. That's right. That one, That's to your right. point, it was just the opposite of everything we've ever been taught. Yeah. And, and there's, there is, um, you know, decades and decades of behavioral economics and human psychology research that backs that up. Um, what you're referring to is the difference between, um, look, I think in sales, let's be fair to salespeople. Everyone knows that um, uh, is familiar with the idea of loss aversion. That's why we we dangle the 10% discount. That's why we dial up the FUD, right? It's this idea that people hate losing more than they like winning. And so if you're going to lose out on it, you don't want to lose out on that 10% discount. You don't want to lose out on that opportunity to fix the status quo. That's why we dial up the FOMO. But when you when you peel it back one more layer, what you learn from the research is that there's actually two types of loss that people get concerned about. One is, as you said, a loss that is a result of inaction, of, of failing to do something right. You know, the other is a loss that is due to action, which is you actually did something wrong. And of those two, people avoid like the plague, loss, it, error, what's called errors of commission, losses that result from their actions. They're totally okay with a loss that results from inaction. That's called an error of omission. And that's generally known as the omission bias. And it's very, very powerful for us as human beings. And it's very powerful uh, in sales. And I think we've in sales failed to recognize this is not a customer thing. This is just the way people are wired, right? It's part of our, our nature. And our, yeah. It's our a human DNA. thing. Yeah. 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 So we're all, we're all sort of wired to assume, I think, especially in sales when, when your job is to persuade and, and, and motivate that the, the number one thing I need to do, and maybe in some cases, the only thing I need to do is to show them that they can s succeed by going down this path. But in the back of their mind, often it's, you know, what if I do fail? And that that kind of gets to that notion of like, okay, I I'd rather do nothing than do something and get blamed if it goes wrong. Yeah, nobody gets. We we say this in book. Nobody gets fired for for uh, picking the leader us. quadrant. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. no. Well, well I was going to say, yeah. I was actually going to say, nobody gets fired for um, uh, maintaining the status quo. Like the status quo is born of many mothers and fathers, and, and you know <laughs> has many parents in the organization. Lots of people to blame. 
Uh, but people do get fired for trying to change the status quo and having it not work out. Uh, when we presented this a few weeks ago, Ted was Ted was there um, with me in San Francisco, and we were presenting to a group of sales leaders. And somebody came up to us afterwards and said, "Right before your presentation, I literally got off a closing call where I did that whole. I tried to create the burning platform. I tried to use the price based urgency. I even tried to say, hey." We've got so much business coming in. We're not going to be able to implement your, you know, the solution for you until like Q2 next year. All this kind of stuff, just try to scare them into action. What I realized was this person actually cares a lot less about any of those things than they do about losing their job or or even just lose, you know, a loss in face or reputation internally. Like that is a big deal for people. They don't care about the 10% discount. They don't care about the having to wait a quarter to install your solution. And they also don't care about not changing the status quo because you know what? That was there long before they even gave it to seat. And it could be there for long after. And there are lots of people to blame. So I recently had that light bulb moment and it was uh sell at the time it was selling like this HR software that's really like a nice to have. And ultimately it came down to is this will is this CHRO at this big company willing to put the reputation on the line? And uh, that, yeah, that was definitely a light bulb moment. What, what has the, um, not to get off track, but what has the response been so far? You mentioned you guys presented to that team, but I'd love to hear like, what are you hearing? Are people like not, like I'm, I'm nodding when I'm reading the book, like, oh, of course, you know, price right. increase. Oh, right. Of course we're doing this. Like it, it's not working. Uh, but what has been the initial response? Yeah. You, you, what you mean is like not to get more off track than we've already got. <laughs> so it's all I, good. It's all good. Wanna, Please so, keep your answers short. <laughs> I know. <laughs> There's a limit to how much digital tape we have here. So I would, um, yeah, I think the response has been really positive. I, I would, I, Ted and I often contrast this with uh, challenger for instance, because I think challenger um, had a different kind of reaction. I think well, there are a couple of things that were different. I think one is like, that was our first book. We, nobody knew who we were. Um, we came out and said, like, basically, like, the emperor has no clothes and, and made some pretty bold claims about the nature of the relationship in sales and what best salespeople do differently. And I think we got a lot of hard questions about, like, who are you guys to say to to come out and say this? And you're just a bunch of researchers. You're not even salespeople. Can I add and, one thing? You guys were also telling people to completely change your playbook, like totally, rip out, yeah. <laughs> you know, new new offense. Tom yeah, Brady's here. Right. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. So. So there was some of that too, right? And, and let's be honest, like the naming is also like con confrontational um, and uh, it, it just, it grabs you by the lapels and shakes you. But I think exactly to your point, the, you know, I think the pushback we got, it, ultimately, like I think half the people like hated Challenger and half the people loved it. But here's the thing, it's like everyone wants to talk about it, which is in some ways it's like an Escher drawing of like one hand drawing the other. It's it's kind of what we say you should be doing uh, around your content marketing, around your your positioning and messaging and sales. Uh, is you do want to provoke your customer. You do want to get them to think differently. And you, you, unless they react by trying to call BS on you, you haven't pushed hard enough. And that's kind of what happened with Challenger. But I think a lot big source of the pushback, as you said, was, wait, hold on a second. You're telling me everything we've been teaching our salespeople to do for, for years now, and the thing we've invested millions of dollars in, and we you know, brought in sales training firm for, and if you enabled out the wazoo, you're telling us to burn the boats and start over? Like, no thanks. Even if they did buy it, that was a big holdup. Now, I think with the new book, it's a little bit different. So I think like Challenger, I think, um, you know, tenured, experienced, uh, talented salespeople like yourself, they nod and they say, yeah, like I didn't I didn't know I was doing this. Like I got a, a LinkedIn voice message from um, a high performing salespeople, just uh, yes, a person just yesterday. I was playing it for Ted. And uh, this guy said, he was talking about the maximizers versus satisficers part of the book. We're talking about like personality or uh, uh, indecisive personalities. And that's one of the things we talk about. And he said, I never realized this, but I always use that as a tell about whether to pursue an opportunity or not. Could the uh, could the customer articulate what was really important and what were the things that were not important? And that did that actually align with what we're good at and what we're not good at? And if it didn't, I would tell them to go buy from somebody else. And I never had a name for it. I never realized why I do it until you guys explained it. So Challenger had that effect too. Top salespeople would read it and say, you gave language to the thing I've, I've been doing. I, I'll tell you the one thing that we, maybe it's because we learned our lesson the first time a little bit with Challenger, but the one thing we've realized with this book is that that message of like burn the boats is like a tough pill to swallow. And um, what, and I don't think it is a, a pill that you need to swallow with Jolt. A Jolt is actually specifically an overlay or an attachment to whatever you do right now. The message in Jolt is whatever you're doing today, whether you're a Challenger shop, your medic shop, your Sandler shop, it doesn't matter. 
That is your playbook for beating the status quo. And you got to do that. You're not going to sell anything if you don't beat the status quo. Keep doing that. Be excellent at that. But you also need a playbook for overcoming indecision. That's a FOMO playbook. You need a dial down the FOMO playbook, and that's Joel. And so it attaches to whatever you're doing. And, I, and I'll tell you, Ted and I have been on tons of calls with sales leaders and enablement leaders, and they're like, thank you for not now telling me once again I need to burn the boots <laughs> like you did last time. So <laughs> if I could just add one other thing here, kind of often, which is, you know, we knew indecisions there, but it's also sometimes a hard thing to spot because these are kind of an off, often are sort of deep, dark fears that buyers may not come out and say, hey, I'm a highly indecisive person and I'm not going to make a decision, right? So, you, But you know in your gut, it's kind of there. I think the surprise that people have had is, you know, when you go to study this with AI and machine learning, like we did two and a half million calls, what you find is it's actually a lot more present than you might have otherwise thought. Uh, so 87% of opportunities had either moderate or high levels of indecision. And it's not just a late stage thing, which is another reaction you often get. Like, is this just something that happens, you know, right before they sign the contract, they get cold feet. Indecision we found can happen at all points of the decision as early as the first conversation. And so, you know, you have to find ways to deal with it throughout that decision process. And that might differ across that, but that is, you know, kind of a thing that people have, have been a little surprised about. I appreciate you sharing that context. This is one of the, one of the things I've thought about. I love for you guys to reflect on this is um, there's a great sales trainer um, who did something for us a couple of years ago. One of, one of the parts of his training that really stood out to me, he talks about like the, the reputation or the equity that a salesperson or rep may build um, you also have to think about like death by a thousand paper cuts. It's usually not like one thing that you do, but it's those like small moves that you make that are not in their best interest that sort of degrade the equity that you might have built or you haven't even built at all. And so when I was like reading this, I was thinking like, oh yeah, like that, that sort of injection of a price increase done in a transactional way when there's really like no business case and you're just like putting it, you know, like these little micro moments are how you sort of devalue yourself yeah. Um, yeah. on the other side. Do you guys agree with that a little bit? Cause I, that's how I felt when I was reading the, the FUD section, especially is like, these are, yeah. the, these are the moments that like you can make or break yourself. I mean, I think not only do we agree with it, I think we might even go one step further, which is that I think there's a lot of evidence that you actually walk in the door with negative equity. You know, not just and, and not not because of anything you might have done, but because of past experiences those buyers have had. I mean, who who among us has not felt like they've been oversold at different points or bought more than they should have or uh, and all these things erode the perspective, the trust that that buyer has in this person's ability to guide me down this path that's good for me uh, and for my organization. And so you you're almost fighting from behind, um, not not for anything you might have done. Uh, and so absolutely, I think a big, big takeaway from the study is you've got to find a way to to build up that equity is a good way to put it, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um, the thing that we talk about in the book, and, and this is another very, <clears throat> very real phenomenon, um, is the principal agent dilemma, which is in any uh, commercial yeah. relationship. So um, think about uh, think about uh, the salesperson, the customer, it could be a real estate agent, a home buyer, you know, whatever the that commercial relationship is one party has more information than the other party. And what um, what the other party, in this case, the customer's fears is that uh, the person with all the information is incentivized to um, oversell them, to hide the the negative information, you know, not, not air the dirty laundry. And that information asymmetry really creates this lack of trust. And what that actually leads to, at least in sales, is the customer then wanting to become an expert themselves, leaving no stone unturned, doing endless amounts of research, right? Um, one of we talk about this uh, when we present um, uh, the jolt effect to sales teams, but you know we've always been told in sales you need to be a trusted advisor, but I it's so overused. Um, it's like customer centricity. It's so used or empathy is used so often it's almost meaningless. And so what we try to do in the book is get down to brass tacks. Like what does it sound like to be a trusted advisor? And um, Ted hit on one of the key things here, which is you in specific moments of the sale build up that equity and you establish that trust. So quite literally, the way it happens in a sales conversation is when the salesperson tells the sales, uh, sales tells the customer, you know what? I don't think you need the premium version of our platform. I think the standard version would be just fine. Spend your money, spend your extra dollars on something else. Or you know what? I know you're really excited about that integration. I got to be honest with you. It's not really ready for prime time yet. And I don't want you to predicate your 
purchase or your business case on that being the primary driver, because I don't want you to be disappointed. We're still ironing out the kinks. Or like I told you that one uh, salesperson left me the LinkedIn voice message. Um, would you ever tell the customer that actually buying from a competitor would be a better option for them? I mean, these are moments where the suddenly the customer realizes, oh, this person's not here to oversell me and, and hide the bad information. They're here to help me get to a good decision, whether that's buying from them, buying from somebody else or not buying at all, right? And that's that's the first step. Now, of course, the other part of being a trusted advisor is like actually being in a position to advise the customer. And, and this kind of, I'm thinking about your first question, all these pitfalls. I'll throw out another uh, set here. Salespeople get this wrong dramatically. So they, they kind of screw up the trust part, but they also screw up the advisory part, which is, um, you've got to own the flow of information, something we talked about in the book. What that comes down to is if you're selling tech, for instance, you should try to do more of your own demos and you should try to talk more confidently about the product. And you should try not to bring the clown car of subject matter experts along with you, you know, the product person, the CS person, the, you know, the executive sponsor, all the, the, the folks, because all that does is reduce your own credibility in the eyes of the customer. If you've got to rely on everyone else to talk about the product, then, you know, what value do you bring to the table? That's a a sales per, uh, that's a customer who's going to go do a lot more research because they believe the salesperson doesn't know a heck of a lot of a lot more than they do about the product they're trying to uh, they're trying to evaluate. The other thing is you got to think in an, in an anticipatory way about um, what's really going on in the customer's stated objections. So um, you know, objections happen a lot in sales. We found in the in the data um, that. Uh, average performers uh, tend to ignore a lot of the objections that are raised. I think it's almost like, I'm just going to pretend I didn't hear that and keep going and uh, <laughs> maybe it'll go away, right? Um, high performers address 100% of the objections that are stated, but they, they actually do more than that. They listen for signs of implicit non-acceptance, which is, you know, the difference between the customer saying, when you know, hey, did I, did I address your question? And the customer saying, absolutely, versus the customer saying, yeah, I guess so. Now, if you're an average performer, those are the same thing. And you check the box and you keep on with your script. If you're a high performer, you hear something, uh, just, there's a disturbance in the force there, right? And so you unpack it. You try to understand what's going on here. I don't want to read into it, but it sounded like maybe you didn't totally buy my answer. Maybe there's something else you're concerned about, um, et cetera. And they anticipate unstated objections. They actually introduce objections before the customer even articulates them. You know, other customers like you, uh, are often worried about this. And and behind the question you asked is this other question. I don't know, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but if, if you are worried about that, you wouldn't be alone because a lot of my customers ask me about that. So love to get on the table so we can talk about it. These are all moments where you are showing the customer that you're trustworthy and you know what you're talking about, right? You've sold this solution to people just like that customer. You are an expert. And what happens in that moment is the customer stops trying to be an expert themselves and they start putting their faith in you to guide them to a good decision as an expert. That's the recipe for getting your customer to like stop doing endless research and trying to be an expert, which they never will be because they're not you. They don't right. sell this stuff for a living, right? I mean, it's the 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 question I've thought of. I'm sure a lot of people have thought about this. Like, how do you how do you begin to disarm someone so they can have an open conversation with you? And I think yeah. part of it is like making recommendations that are in their best interests and in being yeah sort of, I think you guys call like radical candor, essentially being able to yeah. do that. Yeah. I mean, you got to earn the right to do that. Right. And and you got to, um, but there are those moments when you have earned the right to do it, when you can tell the customer, look them in the eye and say, I know you want to do another reference call. I've got to be honest. That's not, I don't think it's going to address what's holding this up. So let's have an honest dialogue about what your concerns are. And my only objective here is to get you to the right decision for you and your company. And, and whether that's buying from us as buying from a competitor Staying, sticking with what you do today. Um, let's just get to that decision together, and let me be helpful in that process. You know, those are um, those moments are are moments that are earned, I think, by salespeople. Love that. Let me ask you guys this: Was the pandemic the genesis for this book? <laughs> yeah. And yeah. if so, in what way? I'd love to. Yeah, as it was the genesis for everything the, you, in our yeah. lives these days, I think. <laughs> our, our baking skills, <laughs> our endless Netflix watching. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we Ted and I were working at a company called Tether uh, at the time, which is a, a machine learning company. They're in the conversation intelligence space. So they take recorded conversations and um, uh, and use machine learning to study those to surface insights. Um, now we saw this opportunity because um, we're huge nerds. So when March of 2020 rolled around, um, sales became 100% virtual overnight. I mean, we're you mentioned uh, Neil Rackham early on. We're huge fans as well, and we always wanted to do what he did, which is 
travel the world and sit in on sales conversations with clipboards and take notes. And like, I, we could never find anybody to pay for that. So, um, but when the, when the pandemic happened and working in the space of conversation intelligence, we said, holy cow, we could now study sales in the way that uh, Professor Rackham did um, and do it at scale. And so we recruited several dozen companies, harvested two and a half million sales calls, and then used Tether's machine learning platform to study those. So um, it, it was, it was, I think, a potentially once in a lifetime opportunity to study sales in a completely new way. Um, I know a lot of sales sales are still virtual, but you know, even I was at uh, speaking at SKO yesterday out in Las Vegas, and uh, even talking to that team there, they sell insurance technology. Uh, they said they're they're starting to get back out on the road. So now we're going to enter the world again, where yeah, we can study some of the the Zoom calls, but some of those really important conversations are still happening face to face in the client's office. Yeah, I think even. Lots of meetings where even if you are in person, there's at least a couple other people on the phone. Yeah, you know, I think the days of having like a dedicated inside sales team is the only team that talks on the phone. It's like eh, that's not really how business is done these days. Yeah. What do you guys think was the most difficult part for me? It was like the ability to just like grab a copy with somebody to just build a relationship. Um, I remember sitting down with like a head of security at a health insurance company here in Portland. I couldn't do that anymore. Like yeah. that, that personal connection was gone. So I had to like refine my own. I felt like I had to refine my own skills to, to compensate for that. Yeah. I, I think there's a lot. I mean, Ted, you go first, but I've, I've got some thoughts too on what. Well, I think you know, from an organizational perspective, you hear a lot about how lead gen was, became really, really difficult overnight because the only way to, you know, conferences went away and trade shows went away and, and then everyone had their own webinars and their events and then everyone got webinared out. And so there was only so much. And those busy. are all cool for like five minutes and then they became very yeah, uncool. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. How many, how many times can you send, you know, a DoorDash to, to somebody to get them to come to a, a to a webinar, right? Um, and so with less leads coming in, it just it made it harder to squeeze more out of, of what you were getting, I think, from a, a perspective. But of course, you're right. From a relationship standpoint, of course, it, it's a lot harder, I think, to to build that sort of relationship. And, you know, you talk for two minutes about the weather and where you're where you live, you know, at the moment, the beginning of the call, but that only goes so far um, and, and much different. I think you just can't pick up on as much things as you can in a social setting at a, you know, at a dinner or a lunch table, you know, where you get get a chance to kind of see body yeah. language and whatnot. Yeah, I, I think the other thing Ted and I've talked about is, um, uh, yeah, I use like kind of a, a skiing metaphor, which is uh, Zoom, I think, is like the flat light of sales. So, it, um, you know, you think about like going out and skiing on a, a bluebird day or it's sun shining and you can see everything in stark relief, the little bumps, the the ruts, you know, what to what to watch out for, the ice patches, things like that. And when the cloud cover, cover comes over it, you know, you got to everything looks the same. You can't distinguish the sky and the horizon. I think Zoom has that effect. And what I mean is it's think about our customers or, or us. We go through Zoom after Zoom after Zoom after Zoom, and it all starts to kind of feel the same. And it's what happens, I think, is it makes it really hard for both the customer and the salesperson to actually remember what happened. <laughs> you know, because when you're sitting, you know, when you're having coffee with somebody, or you're going, you're going to a trade show, even, or you meet somebody in their office, there are those specific things that stay with you, right? Like you know, how was the coffee? What was the weather? Did you have to move inside because it was cold out? And, you know, did something funny happen in the cafe or you're in the client's office? Like, what'd you have for lunch? And what was the decor like? And things like that, like those things imprint, like they become markers. And then you remember more vividly what was said and what happened and what the reactions were. And, but when everything's the same and it's like Hollywood squares, it just, it's really hard <laughs> to remember. And you got to go, you got to refer back to your notes. Note taking really is, uh, is coming back in style, I think, because, um, you, you have a hard time remembering what, what was actually discussed. Did they actually like our solution? Did they, like, what was the reaction? And then it's stating the obvious, but the distraction factor is enormous. I mean, nobody's going to go surf the internet in a live meeting because it's like really rude, you know? So, um, but, in, but on, on zoom, it's very easy to fake it while you check out like what's the, what's going on in, in the Portland sports scene or what have you, or what's the weather forecast next yeah. week, you know? That's so true. Wow. Um, yeah, I always I like my approach was the opposite. Like nobody cares about my dog behind me if I'm meeting someone for the first time. How can I deliver so much value in a concise way that next time I request a meeting, they know I'm not here to talk about the weather or like yeah. sort of defer yeah. that stuff. But um there's this this quote that came to my mind by Joshua Foyer and he says, 
uh, monotony collapses time, novelty unfolds it. And it makes me think about going into someone's office or, you know, getting on an airplane. And it's such a different experience than the, the, the Zoom calls back to back. Yeah, there's a, a great uh, book we, we'd recommend to uh, uh, to listeners is um, uh, The Power of Moments uh, by Dan Heath. And he uh, he's really kind of unpacked some of the science as to why that is. Um, uh, what you just described, you know, monotony versus novelty and how do you create those moments and whether it's a sales pitch or it's a, a customer experience of some other, some other type. Um, and even in zoom, I think it's possible for us to create those, those memorable peaks and valleys in the way that we present, maybe pulling your dog on screen as more often as one of those ways, right. But, uh, mm -hmm. but, um, but it's important that you've got to really be dialed into that because in live that happens naturally, but in uh, in Zoom, it, it kind of gets washed out. I mean, not right. to get too philosophical about it, but I think you know we went through a period of time in in B two B purchasing that you could be excused for for you know believing that it was a very rational exercise. You know the the advent of procurement and how 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 involved legal and compliance got in in purchasing and RFPs. You know the the tyranny of the RFP and how everyone's just looking to make business cases over and over again. And whether it's because of the pandemic and everything we've all been through as a society or um or it's just been revealed now through through studies because we had these virtual settings i think what's clear is that purchasing is a lot more emotional than you would have would have expected um, which you'd have to imagine then allows for opportunity to connect on an emotional level um, doesn't make it easy to do so but I, I really love that quote actually the no, i might steal that that the novelty uh, yeah. <laughs> uh unfolds time it's good yeah monotony collapses time novelty yeah. unfolds it and it yeah, was uh it's from Moonwalking with Einstein. It's a book about, a, a, I think it was like a journalist who- Great title. <laughs> right, yeah. I actually thought it was going to improve my memory. It was, well, that's why I bought it. <laughs> <laughs> he ends up like moving to his parents' basement and he practices for the World Memory Championships. And they use oh, all wow. these sort of like ancient techniques of like imagery and all these things. So things I couldn't like replicate. Um, but that was one of the, one of the quotes I thought, I thought of it initially more from like a vacation standpoint, like you've got to, you know, have anchors in time, um, or else like the year sort of blends to itself it's similar, like blending zoom calls back to back. Yeah. Um, but it, it makes, it makes sense. I mean, I think the other thing is, you know, I'd love to wake up at five and go work out, but like, I need a break in the middle of the day to get, <laughs> yeah. like, I didn't sign up for insights. Like I need something to <laughs> separate <laughs> the day, you yeah, know? Yeah. And so right, I think right. that's also have a, a, like a psychological impact sure. on people sitting in front of the computer all day. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things you, I know we haven't even got to like the sales methodology yet, but like <laughs> one of the other things you guys said, I thought um, was really relevant is that, and I'd love for you guys to comment on this, just like the best of the best, you know, that the 7% or so that were kind of doing some of this already, the calls just sounded different. Like, yeah. what do you, what is your reaction when you, when you hear that? Yeah, it's, um, it's almost like the difference between sort of, uh, mono and stereo. I think as you think about the, the, the nature of these calls and there's been a lot, I think written about, um, uh, or conjectured about, I should say on like LinkedIn, for instance, about, you know, talk time and, and what are the audio characteristics of a high performer sales conversation? But a few of the things we found, and, and Ted uh, uh, will jump in with with more detail here. I think um, is one. You know, if you have value to deliver, the whole talk, the whole conventional wisdom, or the the recent conventional wisdom that you should always talk a lot less than your customer is out the window. We actually found that high performers talk more than the customer. Um, and I think that's because they are advising the customer and they are delivering value. And if you're delivering value, like the customer wants to hear that value. Um, Still good marriage advice, but just not for sales, right? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't work at home. It, it definitely <laughs> more of a sales thing. But Challenger doesn't work at home either. So, you know, it's um, <laughs> but uh, so I um, the other thing is it, there's this is funny. Somebody was today, but I think posting on this or yesterday, maybe Ted on uh, LinkedIn. Um, about uh, what yeah. we call this idea of cooperative overlapping, which is was quite literally that high performers actually quote unquote interrupt the and talk over the customer more than average performers, but it's not interruptions and overtalk in the way your parents told you like that's rude you shouldn't do that. It was what um, linguists call cooperative overlapping, which is think about like the the difference between a conversation with somebody you don't want to be talking to and a conversation with like your best friend right in your or your spouse or whatever and it's like finishing each other's sentences and and jumping in between you know those little tiny gaps and and pauses 
And that's the way that like really good friends communicate. And it, it's a sign that you're fully plugged in. You're fully engaged. You're hanging on every word. And you're participating. Yeah. Right? It's Yeah. It's it's active. It's like it also what's called participatory listenership, I think. Yeah. Not to get too technical on yeah. that front, but yeah, totally. And it, it shows that you're, you're engaged and that, that would be the one takeaway I had is forget the talk time, uh, stuff for a moment and just think it's bad. It works both ways. This is bad on either side, whether it's always us talking or always the, the buyer talking. Right. So, you know, it, some people might, might think, look, it's, this is a call where I'm doing the demo. So I'm going to do more of the talking. And then next time I'm going to be at, or, or maybe the previous call, I'm doing more discovery and they're doing more of the talking. I think when you look at the high performer calls, it's never <clears throat> one or the other. It's always both. It's a dialogue. And it really does feel like, you know, m- maybe not combative necessarily, but certainly there is a back and forth exchange to include sometimes a bit of overlap as they're showing each other. Yeah, yeah, we're on the same page or we're not. I'm kind of picking up on this, which, you know, again, to Matt's point, does make sense. These are the type of conversations we have with our friends, uh, our spouse or, or or anyone else in everyday life. It shouldn't be all that surprising that in sales, the same thing uh, holds true as we sell to human uh, buyers. But for some reason, it just runs counter kind of to the typical sort of sales conversation. Yeah. And it's, it's not, it, Ted, Ted said it, but it's not, the guidance here is not if you, oh, if you talk over people or interrupt them, or if you just talk more than they do, you'll sell more. It's rather think about that. That's just a logical outcome of a fully engaged, dialed in conversation. Yeah, you could see it in the data actually. So the so I can't remember what the the threshold was for talk time. It varied by by setting, um, but it was bounded, right? So so if you saw a situation like if somebody had seventy percent or eighty percent talk time, win rates plummet at that point. That's just too much, right? But it's you know so when we say they, their their talk time is a little higher. It's at the margins. So we're talking 55%, 56%. Right. And the news is that it's on that side of 50%, not that, um, you know, not the other way around. But again, we're not talking, we're talking about a dialogue here. Yeah. You know, I think one of the inherent skills, at least for me personally, it, it, that I'm trying to develop better is listening. Um, there, I don't know. You guys might have seen Listen, Listen Like You Mean It, same publisher. I thought that was amazing. Like yeah. just, yeah. Uh, you know, work... And and home, like listening skills, just trying to cultivate that because I feel like most salespeople, when you think of all the sales trainings, like, you know, yeah, there's like questions, bait and switch type questions, things like that, but not much has been really shared around how to listen better in a, in a meaningful way. Yeah. You know, we we talk about, um, and something we, Ted and I've uh, explored in much more detail after the book came out, but um, the, uh, the, the first pillar of the the Joel playbook, uh, you know, judging the level of indecision, um, a big part of that is obviously being an active listener, right? Uh, but what's interesting is um, it's also about kind of listening for what's going to be on be- behind the statement or what's driving the statement. Because what we find is that many of the signs of indecision kind of are masked as things that sound pretty good, actually. So the customer's enthusiasm for like, um, you know, wanting to do more research and really excited. I want to, let's do another demo with the team. And, and the average performer is like, oh my God, this is great. Like they're moving towards a decision. They're fully engaged. Like they're asking for more. And when my manager asked me for a deal update, I'm going to say like, well, I, this person, I sent them another white paper. They're going to join the webinar next month. They're going to talk to another reference. Good company. news. Well, I have demo. an update. Yeah. yeah, I've got an update, right? It's <laughs> progress. And what high performers hear though, and that is that's a customer who's starting to get wrapped around the axle of too much information. And and this is a recipe for analysis paralysis. So again, I think we need to actively listen, but it's like listening uh, for what's going on behind what the customer's saying. Yeah, there, there's listening. both like in a turn your hearing aid up, you know, listen, you know, hear more of that type of stuff, but also what are you, tr- what are you listening for? Like, yeah. what are the signs that you're trying to, to identify and mark? One of the things you guys said um, in that chapter around the J, judging the indecision is around um, be, there, there's a level of like personal indecisiveness to, in terms of the person that you're speaking to. Can you guys mm-hmm. yeah. maybe just touch on that for a second? Because I thought that was just like really brilliant in terms of like thinking about that. I mean, usually I don't think about that. So I'm wondering, yeah. you know, what, what's the sort of the meaning behind that? There's, there's sort of three... Um... Uh, judging the level of indecision is like a three three part equation. So the first one is what is the source of indecision? And and in the book we talk about again, if we're talking about the fear of messing up, there's th- actually three big fears that customers get worried about. One is um, have I picked the right thing? Uh, have I you know you put a lot of options in front of me? Is the 
version of the solution we're going with the right one for us? And if it's not, that's going to make me look bad, right? That's not a good look if I should have gone with something else and I, I chose the wrong thing. The second um, concern is, have I done enough research? Have I done enough homework? Am I a savvy enough consumer uh, to or buyer so that I'm going to go into this understanding what the what the pitfalls are, what I should know, what I should watch out for, et cetera. And the third one is um, outcome uncertainty, which is the customer feeling like um, uh, they they don't have enough assurance of success. You know, they're they're staking their career, their reputation, maybe just a lot of money, budget dollars on a purchase, and they need it to go well. They need to see that ROI. They need to see the return from that investment. Um, and if they don't, they could lose their job or they could just look like a fool to their colleagues. So those three things, have I picked the right thing? Have I done enough homework? Have I gotten any guarantee or assurance of success? So that's the the source of indecision. So we got to Those are all things that would show up as part of a purchase, right? When you go to that's buy right. something. That's right. And, yeah. and it may show up at different times, right? And in combinations too. Yeah. Um, but that's first... let, let me just tell you that usually we'd say indecision, and then we stop. <laughs> like, <it's just> like, <laughs> right. like our sales leader would say, yeah, it's like we don't lose, you know, to X, Y, Z. We lose to the status quo. We lose to indecision. And right, the right. conversation would just end right there. So <laughs> right, when I read right. that, I thought like, oh man, like I wish I had yeah. this like five years ago. <laughs> yeah. So, so you got to, again, you got a three part equation. The first part is where's it coming from? Second part is that personal level of indecisiveness. I'll circle back to that one because that was your question. The third part of the equation is um, uh, to think about contextual amplifiers. And what I mean by that is, is bud our budget's really tight. You know, has this customer been burned in the past by a big solution in the space where the, the vendor over-promised and under-delivered? Is there baggage they're bringing to the table? Is this, a for this person, a bet the career decision? You know, those are things that could take normally like moderate levels of indecision and really amplify them to make them, you know, super uh, uh, pressing and, and, uh, and big for the customer. But let's go back to the second part of the equation, which is the personal level of indecisiveness. So, you know, this is... Um, uh, there's a ton of uh, psychology research around um, different types of indecisiveness. Um, and we talk about those in the book. Uh, one of them um, I, I referenced earlier is to understand whether the customer we're talking to is a maximizer or a satisficer. A maximizer is somebody who is not content unless everything is perfect. And, and your solution is best on all dimensions, cost, speed, you know, quality, uh, you know, user reviews, et cetera, analyst ranking, blah, blah, blah. Um, a satisficer is somebody who says, across, let's say, the 10 dimensions that we're evaluating, it's these three that are the most important. These other three are pretty important. And those last four, like, we don't really care. So um, that is somebody who is uh, content with, they know what they want, they can prioritize, but they're content with good enough or not important on other dimensions. And, I, you know, I mentioned earlier that that salesperson said that, you know, boy, I never really fully appreciated this until I read that in the the J chapter, that this is actually a a documented personality type, or not personality type, I should say, but but marker of indecision. Now, the other one I think I'll, I'll share with you, which is another sign of of a personal indecision, um, is the difference between uh, procrastination and decision avoidance. So all customers procrastinate, like it or not, they all do because they have day jobs, which is not to buy your stuff. And so they all kick things down the road. But what we learned in the research is that in high performers actually helped us figure this out when we interviewed them. They said, look, there's a big difference between a customer who says the Zoom call that was scheduled for Monday, can we do it on Wednesday or Friday instead because I have a conflict? And the customer who reaches out and says, you know what? I would love what you're talking about, but priorities are shifting here. And I think we should pick this conversation up next quarter. Or you know what? Better yet, next year. Now, when an average performer hears that, they're like, cool, I'll just forecast it for next quarter, you know, or well, it's they didn't say no, right? And they're just, you know, priorities are shifting. When a high performer hears that, they they see a customer who's not procrastinating, they're avoiding the decision entirely. They may not even know that that's what they're doing, but they have no intention of making a decision. And that is a customer that gets kicked out of my pipeline or put way back on the back burner because I don't have time to pursue them. So these are person like personal markers. So again, it's the source of indecision. It's the, the person we're dealing with. And then there are these contextual amplifiers. Those three things tell us what's the playbook to get the person over the line? Uh, when should I forecast this thing to actually close? I mean, should I even spend time on it or should I disqualify them out of my pipeline? Okay. Le we need to hit on the other ones too. So oh, okay. um, <laughs> yeah. if we could offering your recommendation being sort of the, the second stage here, you know, um, here's what I would do if I were you. I feel like we've touched on it quite a bit earlier on, right? It's like putting yourself in their shoes. Um, is there anything you would add to that just in terms of like 
the O offering your recommendation? Like what are some of the key things that um, salespeople should maybe keep in mind if they haven't been doing already? Ted, why don't you talk about this one? Because sure. the reality is we, we actually already did talk about the L, which is limiting the exploration. We were talking about that being a trusted advisor and how do you earn the right to stop the exploration, the endless consumption of information. But Ted, tell us about the O, the offering yeah. recommendation. Yeah. And I think, you know, to your point, the the very notion of of making a recommendation is not altogether foreign. It's something that we all do, you know, on an everyday basis, whether it's you know, making a recommendation to to your best friend about a great restaurant or a great movie or a great show, um, but it can be not not used quite as often as you might think in sales. And I think particularly the part about getting personal with that recommendation, which is a a point I'll come back to here in a moment. I think this gets kind of the heart of the way most of us have been trained in sales, which is that the inspiration for moving forward has to come from the buyer. You know, far be it from me to tell you, Mr. and Mrs. Customer, what's most important to you and what what your priorities should be. That's the whole point of discovery. Is I we've already landed on these big problems, and so where where sellers get kind of hung up in this O part is they use diagnosis as the inspiration for where to go. So you hear things like, you know, a buyer struggling with is, is should I do this or should I that? I mean, people going back to the psychology are just bad at trade offs. We are just bad at, as humans. We just aren't good at making trade-offs. And that, of course, translates into to purchasing as well. And so when that happens, the buyer says, I'm not sure, do I go with option A or option B? It all looks good to me because these are both right choices. They're both, you know, you could be totally fine going with A or B, but at some point I can only buy one. Which one do I go with? And the seller too often will respond with something to the effect of, well, let's go back to the reason we started down this path. Right. Let's go back to why you just wanted to even go into this purchase to start with, and let's use that as the as the inspiration for which path we take. And so um, that's where they kind of go wrong. And what we found in the data is the better way to to respond to that is to get personal and help help them you know, guide them towards the decision that you know in your gut is best for them. Right. And so there are techniques involved here in terms of advocating towards that sort of personal recommendation and making them feel good about what's in the shopping cart, but also what's not in the shopping cart as well. And so there is some skill and technique involved. But I think first, most important lesson for the seller is be careful with answering that with more diagnosis. I think you're on mute. Oh, yeah. Sorry, this is the best practice with kids in the background. Just live on, <laughs> been there, live been on there. mute on Zoom. Um, just on the L one more time, what can we learn from General Colin Powell and his leadership principle around oh, yeah. information? Yeah, so uh, Colin Powell um, had this um, observation that great leaders make decisions with somewhere between 40 and 70% of the information required to make the decision. Uh, he said that when you make it with less than 40, make a decision with less than 40% of the required information, you're just kind of guessing, you're shooting from the hip. And if you wait till you have more than 70%, you're just doing research for research's sake. And, and you run a high risk of engaging in analysis paralysis. And what we actually found in the data is that that's not just true of leaders, it's actually true of customers too. When we indulge customers' endless requests, there's a there's a a perfectly natural amount of research and learning that the customer should do. Uh, much of that actually happens before they even reach out to us. But even after they reach out to us, like we're going to take them down the learning curve pretty, pretty dramatically by showing them the platform, showing them our solution, having them talk to you know maybe a subject matter expert, you know doing reference calls, uh, demos, etc. Maybe a pilot or a proof of concept trial. But at that point, like they know enough and they should shift gears into buying something, right? And what they'll do, their knee-jerk reaction is to ask for more. And when salespeople indulge that request, um, they really drive down win rates uh, in dramatic in dramatic ways. Those are customers who really get wrapped up around the axle. And there's this irony right now in this in the world where there's so much information about any kind of purchase decision, the customer feeling like they haven't consumed enough. You know, it's the white paper I didn't read that has all the answers. You know, yeah, no. um, so we see it all the time. I love that. Okay. <clears throat> Last question on taking risk off the table. We hit on FUD earlier on. If you gave a salesperson one piece of advice, so the chapter is is gold. It's got so many, so many gems in there. But if you gave one piece of advice that the best salespeople do in terms of taking risk off the table for a customer, what would that be? We're both like we're both paralyzed by. No, I was, was going <laughs> to say we might one, we might cheat, and I'll take one, and Matt can have one, uh, perfect. Uh, perhaps. <laughs> but no, I think I think people underestimate the power of just simple expectation setting. Yeah, you know that. Um, 
this is probably one of the easier ones to do, but we, 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 you know, it's very easy, especially for that average performer who, you know, sees that big gap to goal on the quarter to let that buyer talk them into a giant deal and get their, their eyes bigger than their stomach. And, and, and they start throwing out words like transformation. It could be so tempting to want to sell them the big, you know, whole whale that they're going to swallow. And we know how hard that can be for them to then sell that change internally. And they know, you know, the high performer or our more experienced reps know, you know, sometimes it's better to to start smaller or at minimum to set their eyes and their sights on believable, realistic, achievable expectations. Um, and so again, some technique involved there, but I think the first lesson is like, be very careful about not letting, like letting the buyer expectations run wild. Yeah, I, I think it's a great one. And the reality is, you know, um, that outcome uncertainty, uh, you know, the feeling like the customer is not going to get what they're paying for, they're not going to see the full benefits of the purchase. As Ted's saying, the seeds of that are planted very early on when you miss set expectations. And, and average foreign salespeople love to do that. They love to to promise gaudy ROI projections and and these kind of, you know, look at this like gold standard case study on our website. Like that's actually what you should expect. And you know, that's all like a once in a lifetime. <laughs> like it's great marketing content, but it's nothing you should build your business case on. Um, so high performers carefully manage expectations. Um, and the other thing I would say is there are always, I think a lot of people, when they hear this take risk off the table idea, they kind of jump to the conclusion that, you know, I I guess I like what my company doesn't allow me to offer a prorated refund. So there's nothing I can do there, but there's lots of creative ways to do it. I'll give you one example. Uh, a company that participated in the research was a SaaS company and their um, best salespeople, same company, their best salespeople sold uh, like 3x the amount of professional services with every deal than their average salespeople. Now, on the surface, that's not surprising because they're high-performing salespeople, so they sell more of everything. But um, when you listen to the calls, what you found was the way they positioned professional services was specifically as a safety net. So these high performers had figure out that they A, sell more, and B, take risk off the table for the customer by saying, you know what? I know you want to do this yourself. And that's a beautiful thing about our platform is that you can, you can learn, you know, you don't give you the fish. You'll learn how to fish yourself. We have all the, the videos. We have all the customer success team support you could ever desire. You are perfectly well equipped to do this on your own and see all the benefits we talked about. But what I'd like to do is, is have a slug of, let's say like a hundred professional services hours that we just attach to the contract and view that as a, in case a break glass, in case anything goes wrong, if this starts to slip, we have the A team there to swarm the problem, get you back up on track. So they position it as like an insurance policy. They don't give it away for free. The customer sees that as a great option that de-risks the purchase for them. I love the creativity. Uh, just in the sake of time, guys, I know you got to run. This is awesome. I feel like you guys gave me what I needed. Is there anything I missed or anything you guys wanted to add? Yeah, you know, I think the only thing I would say is, you know, for any of the listeners who want to learn more, obviously check out the book and um, come visit us at joltefect.com. We've got a ton of resources on there, a lot of free resources you can download, coaching tools and otherwise, and then a lot of support uh, that we're providing for companies who want to roll this out to their sales teams. Sounds like good therapy as well. <laughs> 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 All right. Thanks, guys. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah. Thanks great for having me, sir. Great. Appreciate great it. Great to be here. Thank All right, you. See you guys. Bye.